Hello, I'm Dr. Pierre Simon, and it's wonderful being back with you. We've been in the series of moral decision making. Today we're on social conformity part two. Uh, but I want to remind you that at New Horizons Institute of Counseling, we're for healing, peace, and harmony. Give us a call if we can help you in some way. Well, uh, this has been an interesting series as we've started with it. We're almost in the middle of it, talking about social conformity. Uh, we spoke about it last time. Today we're speaking a little bit more about the, uh, the downside of social conformity. Uh, this is based on uh, Dr. Peter Jennings' uh, uh, work in um, moral decision making. He identified seven uh, moral decisions that we could call them spiritual decision making as, as well. Uh, moral decision making is something we all have to experience. We all have to develop the morality, uh, the values uh, within our cultures and, and within uh, our relationships with one another, uh, but also our relationship with God. And in developing um, these uh, moral uh, uh, decision-making characteristics, uh, Dr. Jennings identified uh, that there's a point in which they're immature, and then there's a point where they mature. So. Um, similar to defense mechanisms that occur. There's a whole bunch of defense mechanisms. I have a whole table that I've written out of the defense mechanisms, and they, they've identified immature defense mechanisms, mature defense mechanisms, and so on. Um, and here is a category where um, there's immature uh, decision-making processes, and, and there's mature, and we're still in that immature area of social conformity. And as a reminder within God's design law, moral development is a process in which people will form a developing sense of right and wrong, proper and improper. So we're all, we all go through this. We all have to learn right and wrong, what's, you know, what's agreeable to others and uh, how to get along and so on. So in part two, of social conformity. We're focusing on identifying some, and I, I want to emphasize some, it's not all of them, uh, of the adverse effects of this immature level of moral development. So somewhere along the process, this is, might be an area in adolescence uh, uh, that we reach uh, where social conformity becomes important or, or early adulthood uh, where that may occur. but. Uh, as, again, a reminder, what is social conformity? The term conformity is often used to indicate an agreement. Now, that agreement can be towards a majority position uh, brought about either by a desire to fit in uh, or a desire to be liked, so be normal. In other words, look normal uh, into that group or, or wherever you may be or because of a desire to be correct. Correct being, uh, that's informational. So there's being normative or normal, there's informational, and there's identification, which is simply to conform to a social role. And in those three areas, th those three areas identify social conformity. When I look back in my life and I think, okay, well, where, where was my phase as I went through social conformity? And, um, and hopefully I'm not in there anymore. And I, I, I'm sure I'm not in there anymore. I can get grouchy sometimes. Uh, well, I look back and I think that what pops into my mind is, is high school. Uh, it, you know, you, we all want to conform in high school. We want to fit in. It, it, there's a point uh, where we start going to school and maybe it's Maybe it's uh, middle school for some. Uh, others, it might be high school where the recognition is there that, gosh, uh, I've, got to, I've got to get along with these people for the rest of my life. I need to fit in. You know, I need to look normal, especially if things are abnormal or pathological at home. You've got to make corrections to look normal in school because you're going to be living with these people the rest of your life, and so you got to get along. And so, all right, so I'll dress the same, or I'll do this, or I'll do that. And of course, not everybody does that, and there's reasons why, but 
right now looking at it in that, in that fashion, oftentimes it's high school. Uh, college was my, my second on my list. You know, I think, uh, okay, high school, I needed to fit in. That, that was important. Um, there were times I didn't fit in. Um, then college, you know, okay, college, that, that would be my second on my list. Uh, but what, what happened in college was I'd already served a term in the Air Force and I was married at the time when I went to college and uh, uh, we had our first son. Uh, so attending Stetson University uh, was part-time and then I had to work and take care of the family. And so I was more concerned with meeting the needs of Linda, my, my wife, uh, uh, Mike, my son at the time, and later we had Robert, um, and my job, those were my focus of concern, I can remember thinking back then about fitting in at college, and I said to myself, well, well that's really for the younger students. You know, I, let, let them fit in, and I've got to do my part. So I, I think I kind of grew out of that uh, somewhat at that, at that time. Others may grow out of it sooner, others may grow out of it later, and some are still stuck in social conformity, that that's the most important thing in their lives. So what's the downside of social conformity? You'll not be very pleased with the results if you base social compliance upon coerced submission to authority or fear punishment. Now when I say coerced, there's an obligation there, you, that you feel an obligation that you have to be that certain way, you have to conform. And whenever you're in social conformity, there's an obligation to conform. You know, if you're supposed to go to the office wearing a tie, you wear a tie, and if you don't, well, there's gonna be problems, there's gonna be consequences of uh, one, one type or another. So there's coercion involved in that. The reason is that conformity motivated by forced submission to authority or fear of punishment is harmful. That's not freedom. And remember we spoke about God's character being truth, love, and liberty or freedom. Anything that inhibits any one of those, that's not maturity, that's preventing us from thriving to be all that we can be. Because remember, God made us in His image, therefore He put within us the abilities or the, the inner desire for truth, love, and freedom. And when we inhibit one or more of those, we're not gonna thrive. It's like having a ball and chain holding us back from being all that we can we're meant to be all that we are capable of being. Social conformity may become uh, wired in over time, sort of like being in the military, you know, you do this every day and you have to be that way, especially if you're in for 20 years or longer, then you've been wired in. No different with everyday grouping. Once you remain in social conformity, it's, it can be wired in, it goes deeper into the uh, neural pathways, you have a deeper root, a thicker root. There's little nodules, kind of like the knuckles in a dendrite. So you have the, the brain stem, you have the brain cell, and then the dendrites that stick out that make the connections. Well, there's little nodules. The stronger the connection, the more little nodules will, will grow in, in that dendrite. Therefore, it's a stronger connection in those, those dendrites. And when that's wired in that way, it's a deeper connection, a deeper way of thinking certain things, uh, being more precise or detailed in certain ways, obsessive compulsiveness or other things, thoughts, uh, actions, they're, they're wired in. And when they're deeply wired in that way, gosh, kind of hard to change it. And that takes more work to change it. It can be changed, but you know, once you decrease the energy flow, whether it's chemical or, or, bio, or blood flow, the metabolic flow going through these brain cells and dendrites, you can reduce them and, and they'll become 
less noticeable. Those nodules may even disappear, but they'll remain, some, many of them will remain a little bit. They're just not as pronounced as they once were. Well, what tends to happen is they activate more easily in the future if you're not careful. In a way, it's sort of like uh, addictions. You know, with alcoholics, for example, where they say, uh, you know, one drink is too many once you've been in recovery. Uh, it was, they've been wired in to a certain behavior, a certain way of thinking and feeling for such a long time. Now uh, they have to be extra careful not to relapse. Well, the reason is that conformity motivated by forced submission so when you're obligated to submit, obligated to conform to authority or fear of punishment, it, that's harmful. It's, it's not going to be helpful. What happens from that? Rebellion. You know, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But basically, okay, you either comply or you're going to rebel. Uh, if you comply, you become more uh, surrendered. Uh, you're conforming more, however, you may not be conforming on the inside, you're only appearing to conform, which hinders your genuineness, damages your truth about yourself, damages your capability of love, and certainly damages freedom. Social conformity may become wired in, as I said earlier, however, love and trust cannot grow out of the mechanics of behavior. Truth, love, freedom. They can't grow out of the behavior of mechanics. In other words, we can't make a robot, or they can't make a robot, that really has love, trust, and freedom built into it. It just doesn't work that way. Often what will occur in social conformity is what we call groupthink, or extreme polarization. It's sort of like a, a tug of war going on. You've got two groups pulling uh, in opposite directions and you, so you have this extreme polarization occurring. Polarization is a type of rebellion. Either you are with the group or you're against the group. You're against someone or something. So you can be part of the group tugging the war, in the tug of war. You can be part of that group pulling, but what's gonna happen? You know, you got the opposing side who's gonna say, I don't agree with you, I don't want that. And so I'm joining in with this group, being part of this group, and we're gonna pull from the other side and we're gonna see who's gonna win in this regard. Groupthink leads to denying what's real, what I feel or what I believe. It's sort of like if we compare it to evangelism versus evangelism uh, uh, doctrines or uh, Pentecostal doctrines, you know, and, and Bible talks about all of that, but you have groups pulling or, or the polarity of groups where, no, we believe it has to be, the doctrine has to be this way, and the other group, oh, no, we believe it has to be this way. The social agreement within groupthink involves adapting by concealing critical information from each other so that you don't make waves. So that group that's pulling may have a few in there who really kind of think, well, you know, I, I have those spiritual gifts or I have those abilities that, that they're talking about on the other side, but you know, I, if, I, if I'm going to stay in this group, if I'm going to fit in, I can't talk about it. I have to keep it to myself. I have to keep these secrets or conceal critical information so that I'm not making waves, so I, my head doesn't stick above the crowd and so I can blend in, yet I'm never fully part of the group as a result of it. So evidence and experience become very important and it's no longer recognized. So if you're joining in with that group, if you're conforming to that group, they're not going to allow you to express your evidence, your experience of why you may have a spiritual gift or you may believe this, this way of way this other group thinks. Uh, a few things the way that they think they think 
So you can't be genuine. You can't be real. You hinder your growing. You hinder your thriving. And believe me, both sides have their points. Both sides are accurate doctrinally because there's scripture to support both sides. Some are gifted certain ways, others are gifted other ways. That's part of the body of Christ. You know, some are a thumb and others are a toe, you know? uh, but we're not all thumbs and we're not all toes. Let's be accepting of that, but social conformity says, no, you have to be a thumb. And if you're gonna be part of my group, then you have to be a thumb. If you're gonna be part of my church, you have to be a thumb. If you're gonna be part of my business, uh, my organization, you have to be a thumb um, because we're the right one. We're the only one. Uh, the others are wrong. And that extreme polarization intensifies. Uh, the fear of exposure often elevates the intensity of adverse reactions to control the weaker persons or group. So that polarization, when it occurs, and ad that adverse reaction of now I have to over control in order to make it my way, my thumb, the right way, the only way. And in over controlling, then I go overboard in controlling the other thumbs that are with me. Extreme polarization often occurs due to nonconformity of groupthink beliefs or rules as nonconformance to rules raises problems, actions required not to taint the picture-perfect image of the group. Ignoring regulations leads to overreactions and overcompensations, exaggeration in other words, to others and to the laws that are causing the polarity to begin with. Now, one example of this, and, and I've run across this many times in 30 years of Christian counseling, uh, is a Christian school that needs students. You know, maybe they might have, uh, let's say, 800 students, as an example, large Christian school. And they have rules, and that's good. They have a set of, they have a handbook with the rules all the students are supposed to read, and, and parents are supposed to read, and they're supposed to sign off on it before they start school, and everyone's in agreement. And they start school, and now you have some students doing some things that are a bit extreme. And in the manual, it says, well, if you do this extreme thing, then you're going to be expelled. We can't have you here because that's not good. It's not right. Um, you could harm others and, uh, as well as harm yourself. But the Christian school, and it could be a secular school and all that, that's a private school. The, the school says, wait a minute. We need these students because what comes along with them is finances. Uh, we can't lose these, this income that's coming in that part of the student. So let's hedge a little bit with that rule. Let's make it uh, uh, as if we're doing things about it, but uh, we'll minimize what really happened. and. That way we won't lose the benefits that come along with that student being in our school. But you know what, now, now we, we have to uh, look stronger. We have to be more in control um, over the other rules, the other things going on and the other students so that it makes up for where we're hedging a little bit here. And all right, so now we're going to perhaps uh, micromanage the other students, the other thumbs, so that they perhaps are feeling uh, controlled, over-controlled. Uh, and, and what happens next? Uh-oh, uh, rebellion. Wait a minute. Uh, I don't know if I want to be part of this group anymore, these thumbs, because uh, it's aching it, to be part of it. You know, it's like arthritis and, and it doesn't feel good anymore. So let's argue this, let's fight this. And before you know it, you have polarity occurring at extreme polarity. So you have a schism going on, just like in churches where there's church splits. Social polarization may result as the boundaries of groupthink break down, being no longer well-defined resulting in the differentiation of social groups. 
So when you start to break down rules and laws, again, human rules and laws, things are going to happen where you're going to have difficulty defining the limits, defining the boundaries on everything else. And others say, wait a minute, that's not right. Something's wrong there. And before you know it, you have opposition and you have polarization occurring. And all of that is part of social conformity, the adverse part of social conformity. Remember, God's laws, God's uh, design are unchanging. It's like gravity, you know, thermodynamics. Those, those are laws God's, God has created. Um, human laws, we change. We made them up. We added to God's laws, um, as we spoke about in the Code of Hammurabi earlier. Um, we are the ones who control those laws, and if we want to change them, like the school that might change a rule or a law, we can do that because it's to our advantage to the needs of the elite or the leadership or the school or the organization at the expense of the other thumbs. Social conformity often inhibits individuality, growth, understanding, insight, wisdom, and close personal relationship with our Creator God. And you know, close personal relationship with one another as well. Doesn't sound very good. The Bible tells us, my dear friends, don't trust every spirit being. In other words, if you're part of a thumb, Still, don't trust everyone or everything in that group, uh, in that social conformity that you've put yourself in. Only trust God. Only give absolute trust to God. He's the only one that's earned it. He's the only one that maintains, keeps it, in other words. Um, everybody else and everything else is going to let you down. Give the group the trust they've earned, but don't go beyond that because you'll be disappointed and you'll be hurt by it. So many people come into Christian counseling who have been hurt by churches with legalism, with the social conformity that I'm speaking of here, where they exaggerate and go overboard with certain things because they're hedging and, well, this person gives a lot in tithes, so we, we can't ask them to leave, um, so, but we're going to micromanage everybody else. So don't trust every spirit being, the Bible says, but test all intelligent beings to see whether or not they're from God and practice His methods and principles so not human methods and principles, practice God's methods and principles. Because false prophets, false teachers, misrepresenting God, have come out of where? Out of God? No. Out of heaven? No. Out of the world. We could say there's nothing good in the world. Uh, we live in the world, so scripture tells us uh, you're in the world, but don't be part of it. In other words, don't be social conforming just because you want to be a thumb or you want to get along with the other thumbs. Be who you're designed to be, whatever that is. Some might be designed to be the little finger, um, and that's, that's fine. Stop trying to be a thumb. Join in with the other little fingers. But the whole time you're connected to God. And if we're connected to God, whether we're a thumb or a finger, we're more than likely in conforming to what's morally right with God, who is perfect, who is just, who is fair, who has proven that he's truthful, loving, and and uh, exerts freedom, allows us the freedom to choose, to make our own mistakes and to grow from learning from those mistakes. Well, if we're part of that, what's gonna happen? 
well, we're going to become a stronger little finger. We're going to become a stronger thumb. We're going to become better. More circulation, more harmony is going to occur throughout the body as a result of it. Therefore, more harmony inside of you, it, whether it be spirit, soul, or body. There are those who are going to say, no, you have to do it our way because our way, the human way, the human rules are the best. Well, what does experience tell you? They don't want you to rely on experience because it'll tell you the truth. What does truth tell you? They don't want you to rely on truth because you'll recognize there's something wrong with the rest of the thumb. It's not reality based and therefore they keep the truth submission so you can only read this, you can't read that, you can only listen to that, you can't listen to this over here. Wait a minute, something's wrong with that. Yeah. If there's truth coming out of any message, well, you filter that. You filter whatever is not truthful and you, then you pull in what is truthful. You're gaining from it. You don't accept everything that's said, but if it fits with truth, if it fits with science, if it fits with experience, well, okay, it's all fitting together. It's biblical then. Um, why can't I listen to that or pay attention to this or um, practice this if it's all fitting together? Keep that in mind. So you're not led astray by those false teachers, false prophets who want to believe you ought to be just like them. May your troubles be more minor, your blessings more, and happiness come through your door. We'll see you next time when we get to that next level of moral decision making. Bye.